Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. It's right at two. So my name is Elaine Gatto. I'm a medical science liaison with Mead Johnson Nutrition, RB Health. So thank you for coming over and joining us for a few minutes. I'm going to go over a topic today called the milk fat globule membrane, otherwise abbreviated as MFGM, uh, understanding bioactive components in human milk. So some of you in the audience here may have some familiarity with MFGN. Others may have less familiarity with this topic, but I really hope in these few minutes that we can kind of go through and understanding what this is, what it really does, what there's outcomes associated, and really understanding why we continue to research human milk. So going again to a couple of objectives, really understanding how optimal nutrition early in life is critical for our children to, re to really reach their fullest potential to make sure we describe uh, those unique characteristics and bioactive components of milk fat globule membrane that I'm gonna share with you. And then really making sure we have some knowledge of the studies or the clinical research behind this topic. <coughs> so as we think about milk fat globule membrane, again, this is a nut nutritional component that is found in human milk. We go through over time and we think of really what impacts nutrition in early life. And I really like, we often think of it, especially as we put growth parameters on a growth chart, we're always considering looking at parameters like weight, height, uh, length, I should say weight, length, uh, head circumference. But ultimately it's beyond that. And really where our research has really gone beyond just looking at those general parameters to identify growth. Where growth is now really transitioned to understand not growth of just the body, but growth truly of the brain and even growth of the immune system, which I'll get more into. But we think of growth of the brain and how we really understand that 185% of the brain is grown in the first couple of years of life. So more than ever, that first year of life specifically is so critical. If we think about the nutrition going into the baby for the first six, of, six, six months excuse me, of life, we can think really that's one fluid, right? One nutritional fluid is feeding the body, the brain, the mind, the composition for the first six of months of life. And that's either breast milk or a breast milk substitute. That's providing all this basis for growth. We're also looking under beyond the brain. We think of the immune system. Certainly a word that we constantly hear right now is microbiome, or what is that gut looking like over time? That development of that microbiome or of that gut health is really pertinent in that first couple of years of life. As we think that 70% of our immune system is located where? In our gut. So certainly, again, going back to how nutrition is so critical in this really important timeline and how so much of the nutrition that we choose to provide this really can make or break potentially these lifelong outcomes for these infants. So there has some been, there's been some nutrients that have been identified. Certainly most of these are not new to us. These are nutrients I can go back to, for example, we've always been concerned about uh, anemia. So typically a pediatrician will be looking at an, an iron, uh, looking at a hemoglobin, you know, six months, somewhere between nine and 12 months of life. Recheck it later on, again, going back to growth. So certainly ones, but other ones that we've really looked at more beyond just saying the baby needs fat, the baby needs carbohydrate, the baby needs uh, protein. Going beyond that is really looking specifically at those types of proteins or those type of fats, for example, polyunsaturated fatty acids, omega-3s, really understanding what are those specifics um, of those nutrients that are so valuable. Looking at folate, folate we know certainly from many, many years, we've had many grants throughout public health looking at the importance of folic acid, folic acid for the prenatal, for the pregnant mother. Again, looking forward to because if that infant does not have that adequate store, we certainly have that risk time that the baby has at risk for spina bifida or other neuro, uh, neurocognitive defects. So why does that matter? Why is this nutrition really the basis So in understanding what these nutrients are that we're often lacking, but then pulling it forward to, again, what is the long-term outcomes of being dip deficient or on the other end, optimal with these nutri nutrients? So if we think about the brain, certainly all this development or neurocognitive development that is happening, what we say in the first thousand years of life. There was a great paper put out by the American Apathy and Pediatrics last year in 2018 that speaks to those specific nutrients that I just went over and really brings it forward to what's the why? Why are all these nutrients? Why do we constantly speak to the importance of nutrition? But really pulling it forward is, is the outcomes. This time period, these first couple of years of life, as well as prenatally, really make sure that this baby is providing this development. Now, when we speak to parents, we don't necessarily put it in these particular words, but certainly when I speak to a, a parent and speaking about why that nutrition is so important, it's the, it's the first time where the baby can actually um, understand who, looking at a parent or responding to a voice 
or being able to pick up a toy for the first time. These are results of all these building of this nutrition over time. Today I'm going to speak a little bit more to myelination and where we're understanding where that potentially is some of those uh, originations are coming from. Prefrontal cortex, these are all parts of the brains that we're all f very familiar with um, that brings forth these cognitive outcomes for our babies. Uh, and then that last piece where I mentioned the brain, the body, and the microbiome. So certainly the microbiome, we are seeing more and more of how that it can be implica implicated to immune health. We have learned that certainly even the environment of whether or not you have a vaginal birth, a C-section birth, what does that look like? What is being passed on to the baby because of that? Whether or not the baby is breastfed or formula fed, how does that change that microbiome or that gut? And then even things like certainly medications that provided to the baby early on, um, specifically like antibiotics. We know that potentially this can impact continuing all the way on through our adulthood. So let's understand when we really look again at mother's milk and really understanding where human milk comes into, why it's kind of the whys of really it started off when we started to look at human milk research, um, looking at energy. You know, what, what are those sources of energy? As I said, components, those macronutrients we start with. But then really understanding beyond that specific just macronutrient, what's the structure and what ultimately becomes the function. Because like I said earlier, you know, these first six months of life, and beyond, we see so much of really the imprint of what that foundation is going to be later on for this child. And it's so important that we're able to understand what is going beyond just saying that milk has a percentage of fat, carbohydrate, and protein. What is beyond that so that we can continue bring new research in to understand and really um, specifically look at when we're trying to provide a, a, milk, a milk substitute for our infants that we know that knowledge and science behind it. So when you're looking at, um, for example, when Mee Johnson looks at really understanding what's some of that functionality, what that can bring to cognitive outcomes. These are areas of, of really looking at research beyond to say, okay, what is the weight casing value? How does that lactation cycle change over time? What's the value of comparing a preterm to a term mother's milk? And how does that implicate what type of weight casing ratios are in formulas? What is that fat blend? How does it emulate the fats that are in mother's milk? Uh, DHA and ARA, again, looking at long chain fatty acids, something that was never into formula. What's the benefit? What's the outcome to that baby long term? There's some studies, uh, some abstracts being presented today on DHA and RA. Uh, prebiotics, something that we know that's in mother's milk. Probiotics, what are these things that we've started to add into formulas? And then lastly, the one I'm going to spend a few more minutes of time today to really go over is making sure the latest addition to some of, some of the formulas out there is milk fat globular membrane, first introduced in 2016. So what is milk fat globular membrane, or what is MFGM? So if we think about really, this is a, it's a fat droplet, and you can see right on this screen, so you have this really encompassing out of the mammary gland. It's a fat droplet that comes out of all mammals. So any mammal that lactates, whether you're a cow, a rat, a rabbit, or a human, you have MFGM. So any animal or mammal that lactates is going to provide this milk fat globular membrane. You can see it coming out of the duct or the gland. You can see these little cells, so it's being secreted out of that mammary gland. It starts out as a fat globular. It's encompassed into a trilayer, and in the membrane is a triglycerol. So it's really a, a, tr a trilayer membrane of various of looking at fat and of proteins. So a better way of looking at it, this is actually an electrograph of... Um, um, electromicrograph of a rabbit. So you can see literally this is the gland, this is the fat globule actually being extruded out of the mammary gland, which is pretty cool to see. <coughs> so this is another depiction of what that milk fat globule membrane looks like. You can see there's the tri-layers. You can see with specifically, we have the gangliosides, we have phospholipids, sphingolipids, and proteins. So again, this is a component made of fat and protein within this tri-layer um, you can see there are certain components that we're learning of what gangliosides are responsible for from a functionality, phospholipids, sphingolipids that look at myelination. And then from the protein side, really even looking at some of those microbial effects or immune system outcomes. <coughs> Just to see it in actually functionality, so I showed you the component. And then really going back to earlier as we talked at myelination or synapsis transmission. 
For me, I always think of the easiest way for me to think about it. I always like to think of an electrical cord plugging in for my television. So my electrical cord goes into the outlet. You can see this is almost like that axon is the center of my electrical current. I have that plastic wrapping around my, my cord. That plastic protection is my myelination. Certainly that more myelination protects that, that electrical circuit in the center that allows that transmission to happen from my wall all the way to turning the television on. And I always like to say we live in a society we don't like to wait for that television to come on more than a second. Well, certainly that baby, that transmission that's happening so quickly due to the result of the myelination and then axon transmissioning the information to get that knowledge for that baby to respond is what's really happening. That's really to think through what this actual uh, milk fat globule membrane is providing that support. <coughs> so we'll look a little bit at some of the clinical evidence to kind of go beyond because certainly whenever we look at application of certainly new nutrients that are found um, within human milk, let's think about the research. So the research always starts with finding out where it is, how it is, how you can extract it, looking at animal models, and then coming into our true human models. So this is a, a study out of Timby at, uh, Timby at Al, it's out of Sweden. It was first done in 2014. It was a pre prospective, double-blinded, uh, randomized, so a DBCT controlled study, a very high quality study <coughs> coming out of Sweden, out of the one of the university hospitals. Uh, a nice group of babies that were provided this. I always say a good quality study is going to have a breastfeeding reference group. So certainly you have a standard formula group, you have a breastfeeding reference group, and then you have a group that has the formula with the milk fat globule membrane. These babies were enrolled into the study prior to two months of age. They were on the study formulas or on their study protocol through at least, uh, they were fed up until six months of age, and then they were tested at 12 months of age using those Bailey score it's Bailey score testing score, uh, scores of babies, baby, Bailey's, Bailey's three. So again, primarily their input was looking at that cognitive score of Bailey's, Bailey scales, excuse me. So when they looked at, uh, when the researchers looked at 12 months, again, that was their endpoint. After these infants were on their study protocol for at least six months of time, you can see that when they did the Bailey scales to, to look at specific cognitive outcomes, you can see the difference between the standard group so about 60 babies that completed, about 70 babies that completed in the MFGM group, and then about 70 babies, and of course, in the control group of breastfed babies. This was the first time that there was able to show really no significant difference, and again, in this particular cognitive score outcome between the group of uh, babies that were breastfed and the babies that received the MFGM. So as the author concluded, this was really the first time that they were kind of eradicating the gap cognitively for this particular score in this particular study. Why this is relative or important is because in the past, when you looked at Bailey Scales scores, often there was a deficit or a difference between studies that had formulas versus breastfed babies. And so this was the first time that showed, again, one study first time, but showed a, a difference, whereas before there was a lot higher of those score points. So a four point difference that has typically been seen has not been shown in this recent study. This is one that I want to speak to. It's, a, it's still an abstract. It's about to be published. It was by Lee et al. Similar thing is a, a double-blinded, randomized, controlled clinical study. It compared developmental outcomes uh, with a formula that had enriched whey proteins. Again, the, the MFGM is extracted from a whey protein concentrate. This time, this formula had MFGM and lactoferrin. So the babies received a stage one formula which this was done in China, so specifically they had formulas that were stage one and stage two that kind of differentiates for the first six months of age up to six months to 12 months. So instead of in the US where they have one formula for the first year, they set up in stages for the first six months and then six months to 12 months. So they used up these formulas for the first 180 days and then switched to that stage formula from six months up to one year. And then we're tested on uh, neurodevelopmental outcomes the difference, again, between the formulas, the formula is not having the addition of the MFGM or the lactoferrin. Very similar outcome, what did they utilize? Again, they looked at Bailey scales, number three, to kind of develop, see what happened at the 12-month outcome. So measures between what they found, interesting, so they did find very similar to what the Timby study showed. Just pop down, you can see some cognitive score outcomes, about eight points, language, 12 points, motor skills, 12 points. But also in a secondary, they also saw differences of diarrhea and respiratory infections that had decreased. Um, there are other ones that looked at when you do your parents' questionnaire of Bailey scores, there are also some outcomes that were seen improved as well. Um, again, because this is just an abstract form, we wait to the final study to have more of the specifics of the study. So hopefully that will be coming out soon. 
And I mentioned MFGM with the protein piece of it. There is this immune component also that we're trying to really understand and learn more about. So again, as we pointed out, MFGM is this protein um, and fat trilayer membrane. You can see there's about 1 to 2% of the total protein that's found in human milk. And that MFGM components have seemed to have this antibacterial, antimicrobial effect as well. So going back to that study that I just showed you, they did a follow-up study, but this time the endpoint was really to see the effect of milk fat globule membrane on the incidence of infectious diseases or any, any other sort of immune-related responses. So same babies, but instead the study looked at more from the immune side, excuse me. So this was an important result, not expected, and certainly what the, what the evidence showed is some of those babies, when they looked at otitis media, for those babies that had otitis media, that is often common for many babies, and typically more common for formula-fed babies, that's often the association at that first year of life, just as it is, we saw 64 infants that did not have any sources of otitis media or resulting from parents saying that they had an, or an ear infections that were documented. In the standard formula that did not have the MFGM, there was nine cases reported in that first year of life, and only one with the MFGM. <coughs> so certainly had an 89% reduction in those cases of otitis media for those babies that received the formula with MFGM. Again, looking further into the data to see, is there anything that could really postulate why did this potentially occur? As they're looking for the endpoints to see, okay, we've seen this immune health benefit. What is that really? So there was one particular uh, oral bacteria species that came out, and that's mozzarella catarellus. And so this was particularly that um, seems to have a, a bacterial, um, a, a cause of bacterial otitis media, and it was rest prevalent in these particular infants. Um, so you can just see that's just kind of looking at the different bacteria as it goes down, and then there's Maraxarella that it seems to have a de specific decrease. So again, this was just a nice little introduction of literally learning about MFGM for those of you that have had not quite so much knowledge, again, as we learn more and more within research to really understand components beyond just composition, but really functionality and long-term outcomes. So more studies certainly continue. As we always say, more research is needed. I think that's a standard we put on all of our research. More research is certainly needed to look at this particular area of milk fat globule membrane. But the research that has already been provided, um, and hopefully you've seen from to this presentation, that you can really see the benefits of why this research continues on with this area of milk fat globule membrane. So hopefully with this, you found in conclusion that infants require a nourishing diet to support all these nutritional benefits to really encompass in better growth beyond just growth and body composition, but also looking at brain growth and of course immune outcomes as well. That milk fat globule membrane is a complex structure, really bioactivity of fats and proteins that's found in breast milk and all mammalian milk. And then lastly, hopefully we've demonstrated with a few of the studies that have really started to show this brain development and, and immune health for our infants. So there you go. Thank you. Any questions? So, great question. I think just based on the research that is currently out there, there's research as far as this particular research to go beyond as far as at 18 months or two years, no. However, what I can say that is milk fat globular membrane has also been looked out at other populations. So looking at populations of toddlers, for example, two-year-olds, four-year-olds, looking at in response to decreasing potential uh, diarrhea incidents or long-term uh, diarrhea incidents. There's been some great studies out of South America that have looked at that potential incidence, similar to what the Lee abstract showed, where that decrease of diarrhea, which can be very important in some of our countries, where diarrhea is still an incidence of death. So certainly, or mortality. So certainly some of these other areas of, of populations. Specific to this one, no long term yet. Hopefully more to come. But I think we're seeing it where different populations it can be value, especially with our children. Yep. Great. Well, thank you all for coming over.